Hello everyone and welcome to this online lecture containing introductory information about volcanoes. In this lecture you will hear a bundle of beginner's knowledge on this fascinating topic. My name is Dr. Smith and I am very happy to be speaking with you today. Uh, please excuse my setting and my attire. My car wouldn't start this morning so I had to call into the office and do all my videotaping at home today. So let's get started. Um, first of all, what exactly is a volcano? I like to start out with this comparison because I think it's kind of funny and also very accurate. We could compare volcanoes to cats. With few exceptions, they spend most of their lives asleep. A volcano is an opening on the surface of a planet from which magma or magmatic gas emerges. Magma is molten rock containing dissolved gases and crystals, and it originates in the mantle of the Earth, underneath the crust. When a volcano erupts, magma emerges in one or more forms. There are about three forms that you need to know. Continuous lava flows, fragments of lava or magma varying in size from boulders to ash, or rapidly flowing currents of hot gas and rock fragments. The erupting lava and gases build up around the opening or the vent to form the volcano. Um, so where can volcanoes be found? They surprisingly can be found on every continent on Earth, even Antarctica. Uh, about 600 continental volcanoes are considered active, meaning that they have erupted within the last 10,000 years. But there are many more under the sea that we can't see with our naked eye. The location of volcanoes is controlled by plate tectonics. With rare exceptions, the Earth's volcanoes sprout at plate boundaries as concentrated, narrow chains that follow the boundaries along the cracks of the Earth. Over 94% of historic eruptions have occurred along plate boundaries where the Earth's plates are either spreading apart or being uh, pu pushed together. The Earth's crust is made up of plates that fit together like a giant jigsaw puzzle. The Earth's mantle has flowing hot magma inside of it that's heated by the core of the Earth. If the temper temperature is high enough and the pressure is low enough, uh, rocks can melt. The now molten rock that's been melted from the low pressure and the high temperature rises upwards because it is less dense than the rock surrounding it. The molten rock seeps through the weaknesses in the mantle and between, between tectonic plates. There are four main zones in which a volcano can form. First, there are mid-oceanic ridges, which are underwater mountain ridges, created by two plates being pulled apart. This allows magma to erupt through the gap made by the plates. And when eruptions happen in the same place for a long time, magma mountains build up on the bottom of the sea. And eventually they become islands when they poke through the top of the sea. The second zone where volcanoes can form is called subduction zones. Excuse me. If Earth's plates are spreading apart in mid-oceanic ridges, they must either be destroyed or pushed back down into the mantle somewhere else around the world. This happens at subduction zones where denser oceanic crust is pushed beneath the continental crust and carried down a steep slope back into the mantle by sediments and water in the ocean. This is where subduction zones are found. Oceanic and continental plates are pushed against each other when two oceanic plates collide and one plate subducts back into the mantle. This is when an island arc is formed. Thirdly, hot spots are another place where volcanoes can form. As I mentioned before, some volcanoes exist away from plate boundaries. A particularly good example of Hawaii is Hawaii, which is an island chain created by volcanic eruptions in the middle of the Pacific plate. The last type of volcanoes are called intercontinental volcanoes. The branch of volcanism that studies this type is the most complex, simply because it's kind of a mixed bag of information. 
These eruptions occur away from plate margins and can be the result of either a hot spot or rifting of the crust. The magma comes up through continental rather than oceanic crust to erupt at the surface. Now let's look at the second main point of studying volcanoes, which is how volcanoes erupt. It's, it's simple to say the word how, but we really need to look at the word why first. Why do volcanoes erupt? Most volcanoes have a magma chamber beneath them. Mag magma may stay in the chamber for years until pressure in the magma chamber builds. This buildup is generated by an influx of new magma in the chamber, which causes the rock to fracture, and then the magma is eventually released. So why, um, why do some volcanoes erupt with a big bang while others have gentle effusions of lava flows? The stereotypical image of a volcanic explosion is one of a big opening in the top of a mountain and lava explodes out. But that's not always the case. A key factor is the gases dissolved in the magma, which include water, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide, and there are a few other ones, but they're very small percentages. As the magma rises towards the surface, the temperature and pressure decrease, which makes it possible for the gases to escape. Imagine what happens when you take the top off of a can of fizzy drink or soda or pop, whatever you call it, or for more fun, a bottle of champagne. The way gases come out of the magma determines the explosiveness of an eruption. If the magma contains gases and is very fluid, the gases can bubble out and form fire fountains, which is very fun. If the magma is gas rich and syrupy, so less runny, the gases cannot escape easily and will eventually explode out. This explosion rips the magma to shreds and clouds of gas and ash are thrown everywhere. If the magma is viscous but very low in dissolved gases, it will ooze out slowly like toothpaste being squeezed out of a tube. There are many types of magma that you should know about when learning about volcanoes because they're not all the same. A magma's composition is also critical in determining the explosivity of a volcano because the composition largely determines the magma's viscosity. Location is also important because the tectonic setting largely controls the composition of the magma. The way in which the magma flows is called rheology. The classification of volcanic rocks is based on their silica content and their alkali and potassium content. The main magma types are basalts, andesites, dacites, and rhyolites. A key factor in a magma's chemical composition is the amount of silica in the magma, which is found as silicon dioxide. The magmas that contain the least amount of silicon dioxide, which are basaltic lavas, are the least viscous. The silicon dioxide content affects the viscosity of the magma because silicon and oxygen atoms form very strong bonds in interlinked tetrahedral groups. This is called polymerization. Water in the magma drastically decreases viscosity, while carbon dioxide increases it. The amount of solid crystals also has a significant effect. The more solid crystals in the magma, the more viscous it will be. Temperature also influences viscosity. The hotter the magma, the more easily it will flow. Two types of magma at the same temperature will not, however, have the same viscosity because the more silicic magma will always be more viscous. The gas content of different types of magma can also vary. Generally, the more gas in the magma, the bigger the explosion. Thus, the more Silicic magmas are likely to be the more explosive ones. There are a few types of eruptions when we look at volcanic eruptions that we classify into different eruptions. 
The classification of different types of volcanic eruptions began with Italian scientist Giuseppe Mercalli. He started the tradition of naming different types of volcanic eruptions after the places where they were most common. In order from least explosive to most explosive, they are Hawaiian, Strombolian, Vulcanian, Palaian, Plinian, and Ultraplinian. The last two honor Pliny the Younger, who was a Roman writer who gave us the first scientific written description of a volcanic eruption, that of Vesuvius in 79 CE. More recently, volcanologists have developed a relative measure for classifying the size of eruptions, the Volcanic Explosivity Index, or the VEI. Volcanoes come in many shapes and sizes. Volcanoes do not always produce mountains or cones, which is your stereotypical mountain with a hole in the top where the lava comes out. Effusive eruptions, such as Hawaiian and Icelandic types, produce long lava flows that often come out of many fissures rather than a single vent or source. If lava flows from Hawaiian or Icelandic type eruptions keep piling up on top of one another, then they will eventually produce a shield volcano, which is named for the shape that it has, which is like the shield of a warrior, such as Mauna Loa on Hawaii. Shield volcanoes frequently have large craters called calderas in their center, which are formed after large quantities of magma erupt from the magma chamber. The eruption then leaves the chamber's roof without support and thus causes it to collapse. In rare cases, the magma is viscous but contains little gas. In this case, the lava is extruded rather than exploded and forms what is called a lava dome. Domes are generally monogenetic, which means they're formed by a single eruption. Once the eruption is over, the volcano will not erupt again, ever. Unsurprisingly, monogenetic volcanoes are much smaller than polygenetic volcanoes, such as shield volcanoes, which are formed by repeated eruptions over and over again over long periods of time. Mildly explosive eruptions, such as Strombolian, form a small steep-sided cinder cone around the vent. The cone is constructed from the fragments of lava. More explosive eruptions, such as Vulcanian, Pelagian, and Plinian, produce large quantities of pyroclastics. They produce cones like Strombolian types, but they can also have lava flows. Such volcanoes, formed by the combination of layers of lava and pyroclastics, are called stratovolcanoes. When a volcano has a very large Plinian or ultra Plinian eruption, the top of the volcano can collapse into a caldera, cutting off the top of the volcano. Finally, the number and shape of vents also has a significant influence on a volcano's shape. Vents can be either like pipes or fissures. Pipes originate from deep inside the volcano and are connected deeply directly to the surface. Fissures or cracks are found cutting down the planks. That's some basic information that you should know when you're starting to study volcanoes. Have a great day.